what what have you noticed about the whole you know this mainstreaming of mindfulness mm -hmm. and you know uh, sometimes the the the, uh, the opposing viewpoints or the Buddhist mm -hmm. mindfulness community the twenty five hundred year old technology mm -hmm. versus in a mm -hmm. death match celebrity death match um, with secular mindfulness you know, sort of that yeah. strain and I'm just curious. I that say you're, this, you're yeah. like in this whole other place. Well, sure, and I say this when I train that I am a direct beneficiary of the mainstreaming of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I ever would have found it as a practice if it did stay locked up in a monastery or if it did stay so traditional. Because as we've discussed, I'm, I'm from a pretty traditional Christian background myself, so going there anything overtly religious, even of another tradition, probably wouldn't have found me. So uh, Terry Freilich, who's one of my mentors in mindfulness, well, I consider him a mentor now, started as, as just a, I stalked, we kind of stalked each other. <laughs> it's happening all point. the time. Because <laughs> uh, he would come to some of my workshops and I would read some of his books and it was one of those. And uh, you know, he very traditional, studied directly with the Dalai Lama and his people for, for many years. And he was, in one of his training, he was showing a magazine cover about the mainstreaming of mindfulness. What would the Buddha think? And Terry said, I think the Buddha would like it. Personally, I think the Buddha was a psychologist more than sure. anything else. So you'd be like, all right, yeah, yeah. let's get, make a lot of therapists and do it. And, and it's clients. it's the whole one. One of my favorite memes that's out there is about how all truly spiritual paths meet in the middle. So I definitely don't want this to come across that I'm impugning people who have a traditional practice. It, and I also see some danger to people who. I don't think danger is a drastic word, but where. Where it's all about those pictures we were talking about. Like, well, you know, I have to look a certain way when I do it. And it's like making my meditation practice one more thing I stress out about because I'm not doing the 45 minute practices that, you know, MBSR says I'm supposed to be doing. Or I can't come into this place of perfect calm that I see in the pictures. If anything, that's the drawback. I, I don't, for me, I don't see limitation to me having it disseminated because even within Christianity I think you need so many different varieties mm -hmm. for how to teach spiritual practice we've talked about in 12 steps one of my big beefs is when people come through with well this is the way you do it as opposed to maybe there are different paths in the same spirit I have such a beef about that that I'm writing a book about that subject right now very good the uh, book that I've been reading lately is uh, Jack Cornfield's Bringing Home the Dharma, where he actually talks a lot about that subject of it's mm -hmm. great to have all these different paths. I mean, mm -hmm. this is like a gift of yeah. it being 2015, mm -hmm. is that, you know, just with, uh, he's talking from the Buddhist perspective, you know, Tibetan, Zen, Theravadan, all of it, mosh pitting together, right. and the best of all of it becomes available, as opposed to it being watered down. Right. Which is, I think, everyone's fear. I always love how you use the, the term jubu to describe yourself. One thing I, I have written about, I don't think it's in this book directly, but it's in some blogs I've done. I have always felt a lot of Christians look at me skeptically because I'm so Buddhist or so Eastern, and I'm like, oh, but a lot of Buddhists would look at me and <laughs> think I'm so watered down by Christianity. I don't know. I mean, at least I've experienced that. I don't think the Buddha would say that but some let's just say some people who are practicing Buddhism I have often felt like they're suspect of me because mm -hmm. I see so much in Christian tradition especially the monastic the early desert monastic Christian tradition that is so mindfulness and all of these different teachings it's a blend for me and I love looking at what different paths have in common and that's just been a resonance for me since I began on a spiritual path so I tend to get sad when I see people getting into their ghettos of thought mm. about things. Yeah. And it's uh, interesting just from a, the level of, not necessarily from trauma, it, sometimes it can involve trauma, mm -hmm. but just the, the reasons behind that and then watching people either get further into that mm -hmm. or finding their way out of it through whatever the, the spirit is. And I'm thinking, you know, in a lot of ways, dancing mindfulness is a way that someone can really break out of that rigidity if they found their way into it. We try to foster it. We, we try to foster it, especially because so much of our practice is about we don't give you steps. That freaks a lot of people out. We lose, mm -hmm. I think, 
I mean, yeah, we, we lose a lot of people in terms of, oh, well, that was nice, but you know, it's not for me. And I don't judge people for not resonating with the practice, not by any means. But I, I always warn facilitators, because a lot of our classes, it's a pretty guided breath and stretch at the beginning. But then once you invite up people up to the feet and start inviting creative movement, it's like, you know, breathe, notice the flow, dance however you want. It's like, where's the structure? Where's the structure? So we do try to use this combination of breath, creativity, responsiveness to the needs of the body as a way to break from the physical rigidity, but obviously there are a lot of mental spiritual applications there too.